This video is from a touch typing competition. And the guy called Sean has won the competition typing 124 words per minute. Uh, can you touch type? Raise your hand if you can touch type. Uh, keep your hand raised uh, if when you're touch typing, you press the keys with the correct finger. Okay, almost everyone. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I have a friend and um, I've noticed that when he is touch typing, he is placing his right hand uh, one row of set to the right. So his index finger is sitting on, on K letter and he is touch typing like that. And then whenever he needs to press uh, uh, keys in the middle, like Y, H, and N, he has to move his hand, type those letters, and move them back. And I was starting to wonder if, if there is a way to, to tell people when they're learning to touch type on the early stage whether they're placing, placing their fingers uh, on the right keys. Uh, my name is Tetiana Dushinkivska and I'm here to share with you my journey on building a touch typing system. To build a system like that, you need to go through a few steps. Uh, first, you need to uh, display text to type. Then you need to record the key press events uh, from the keyboard. Also, you need to record finger events somehow. And you have to analyze those events. And then as the result, you need to show it to the, to the user. OK, let's go through those steps. And uh, I would like to share with you the tools I have chosen to build such a system. First, display text. For that, I've chosen a browser, as I'm familiar how to work with their web applications. To record key press events, I'm using JavaScript, phase in particular. To record finger events, I'm going to use Arduino, a little bit of C program, and uh, census. But I'll get to that later. And to analyze events, I'm going to use Elixir. But how am I going to use it? Uh, when I first started to build this system, which was on one of the hack events, it was a variable hack event. Um, my uh, Elixir part was a, a Phoenix application, which did lots of things, uh, which was great for the hack event, and it worked. But then when I got accepted for this talk, I thought, maybe it's not quite right. Maybe I should do better. Um, and I've learned how to do better when I uh, joined the company I'm working for now, Informatics. Uh, informatics uh, specializes in combining monitoring, modeling, and control of water supply networks with embedded computing and, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> and uh, data management uh, resulting in integrated solutions for re resilient, adaptive, and calm networks. To put it simply, uh, we help water companies prevent leaks and uh, extend life of the water pipes. So I've learned at this company a lot of good practices and in particular that it's good to structure your applications into different umbrella applications. So my structure looks like that. I'm going to have the logic co-application, which is going to be dealing with all of the uh, matching results. Then I'm going to have the serial umbrella application, which is going to be dealing with getting all of the events from Arduino and passing them to the logic application and the Phoenix, Phoenix application, which is going to be dealing with getting all of the key events and passing them to the logic application. And if you would notice on the slide how good, how good that Phoenix looks like, <laughs> this is my second attempt. First attempt in the cafe, when I didn't have internet, looked like that. <laughs> I dare you not to look how the phoenix look like and try to draw it and maybe tweet it or something. I'll be quite interested to see if, if you could do it from the memory. Um, with that, the full architecture looks like that. And let's go down to implementation. First, we need to generate our umbrella project. Uh, now with the Chris's uh, keynote, I know that uh, the, the, it's easier to do it with a Phoenix uh, umbrella application in place already, but I didn't know that, so I, I did it the long way. 
And then within our um, umbrella application, the umbrella application structure, I could generate my first umbrella application, which is going to use Phoenix. And then we could talk about what Phoenix is going to do. Uh, so the goal for this part is whenever we load the browser, we are going to have a phase of sending the join, uh, join message to the Phoenix channel. And the Phoenix channel returning OK. And then uh, phase is going to render a start button um, just to tell our user that, OK, it's ready. This is how it looks like. And how do we implement it? It's not too hard. So we have our socket. We connect to it. Then we send message to the channel, uh, join a message. And when we receive OK, we just uh, uh, generate that uh, message or button. Um, but we don't have lobby channel. Well, OK, let's generate it. And we call it games lobby. OK, great. And then we are listening to games lobby message on joining. OK, great. That's done. Um, so you could see here, um, when we load our browser, we uh, get our uh, start button. And we log in in our console that we joined the channel. Um, and then whenever we press that start button, we have the message which we are going to type. So let's go to rendering the message. So from phaser, we are sending start game uh, message to a Phoenix channel. And the channel passing it through to the core. Core is our umbrella application, which is responsible for uh, getting the events and, and passing them through. Um, and core is going to accept the socket because it would need on a, st on a later stage to send back the result. And it needs a way to communicate with the Phoenix channel. So it has to have this socket in. Um, the next step is to get the text and pass it back to the channel. And channel is passing it back to the phase. And phase is just rendering it on the screen. How do we implement it? JavaScript part is. It's easy, thanks to Keith, who looks quite tidy. Um, so we destroyed the, the, our initial start button. Then we uh, pushed the message to the, send a message to the channel. Um, and then we're listening in the Phoenix to that message. And whenever we get it, then we're going to call our logic application um, and get back the text and pass it through to the phaser. Whenever we call our call application, uh, we haven't created it yet, so it's time to do that. Uh, so we generate another uh, umbrella application. And uh, within that umbrella application, we implement the init callback, which is going to um, store a text in a state. And for, uh, for now, we're just going to have an empty socket in it. Um, and whenever we get our start game message, we are going to return back the the text, which we have in the state now. And uh, we are going to store the socket in the state so we could continue, to, so we could communicate to the uh, Phoenix in the later stage. Um, to be able to communicate from one umbrella application to another, we need to have some kind of dependency. So we added uh, our core application as a dependency of the web application. And the JavaScript is listening to the, to the message, and then it's rendering text to the screen. Great. The next step is to start sending the key events. Uh, the flow looks like that. So we phaser uh, listening for the key events. Whenever it gets the event, uh, it adds the ID for that event. So it's going to be an event ID. Then it pass it through to the Phoenix channel. Uh, Phoenix channel pass it through to the core. And then core delegating the, th this, this message to the event handler. And event handler is the, the guy who's going to do the, uh, all of the work of, of defining whether it's matching or not. But we're going to get this loop later. For now, let's just talk about how we send those messages. So this is similar. We just push uh, the, the event uh, to the channel with a particular message. 
key. And within our channel, we are going to listen to that key message. And what we get is a key and ID. Okay, and then we call, we call our core application with the, those key and ID, just pass it in. And our core application collecting it, passing it through to the guy who is doing all of the hard work. And with this in place, we have our par one part of our architecture complete, the part which is sending messages. The other part is to send thing events. Okay, how do we do that? So when I come up to the challenge of finding the way with to, to register with which finger you're pressing the key, I looked at various different technologies. Uh, one of them was looking at different software which is going to record the video and, and tell you what you're doing, but it was a little bit hard to determine whether you're actually pressing the key or not. Then I looked at Leap Motion, which was really fun, but it didn't quite work. And I looked at, <laughs> then I went crazy, and I thought, okay, what if I build a keyboard which is going to listen to the fingerprints, and then it'll tell you from the fingerprints which key, finger it is, and I was like, this is amazing, but it's, I have to build a keyboard like that, and I have to buy a bunch of sensors, like they, they exist, but they're very hard to find somewhere in China. And uh, I just thought it's a little bit too crazy idea. Um, so then I found a little bit easier solution. Um, to build a census, a pressure census, uh, which are going to be sitting on the fingertips, and uh, they would be doing all of the job. And um, Arduino and C are there to communicate and tell what those pressure, to, to read from those. How do we build a sensor like, like that? Um, so the sensor has to be uh, small enough so it would go on the fingertip, and it also has to be flexible so it feel, feels nice on the finger. Um, it is possible to build a sensor like that. All you need is Velostat, uh, which is um, a material which gets conductive when you press on it. And if you place it between two conductive materials, which are also flexible, uh, then you get a sensor. Uh, conductive material, this is something pretty exciting. Uh, I didn't know that you could uh, have electronics which you could sew, but you could actually have conductive materials, conductive threads, and you could sew your, your pieces, which is mind-blowing. <laughs> so this is the sensor. Um, I have placed it uh, uh, next to my finger, so th this is how tiny it is. And if we put this well start between two conductive materials, um, then that's our sensor, it's ready to go. Um, but we need to plug it into Arduino in order to test it. So here we go, we plug it in. <laughs> the way we plug it in, uh, one and should go to the power and then an another one should go to one of the analog uh, ports on Arduino and also should go to the ground so it's all working as expected. And we need to write a little C program for Arduino to tell uh, that we are going to listen to analog port, a specific one, and that we, in this case, are just taking all of the signals which are coming from that port. And uh, for test number one, we're just going to print it uh, in our Arduino console. This is the result of the test. Uh, so I'm just logging the result. Um, so I'm pressing the the sensor, and uh, you could see that when, with, when it's not pressed, uh, the values are in the range of zero to 20, and whenever I press it, it comes up to five and, and more, depending on how hard I, I press. So this is good, um, but there was a little bit of, I was missing something. Whenever I would hold the sensor, it would keep constantly sending the, the pressure values which wasn't ideal. So I needed to send it only once, whenever I press it, and whenever I just press it again, uh, it sends it again. So adding a trigger, which is going to tell us if it has been pressed, uh, then send the event, then if you un unpress it, then reset the trigger and then do it again. And that was test for one sensor uh, to build a 
for all fingers, you need sensor for each finger, and then it's, uh, it was sensible to put it in a glove, plug it all together, test it, duplicate the, the C code uh, box for each of them, and that's done. And then uh, there is a little test with the whole sensors built in to one glove. So if you see, I'm just typing one finger another, and this is the events I get. So at this stage, I'm not sending the values, but I'm sending the finger number. So if, like I said, it, I'm counting from index finger. Uh, I know that in UK people counting from thumb, but this is one for me. <laughs> and with this in place, this is few parts of our architecture complete. By this point, I felt like that. <laughs> I was pretty proud that it worked. But we are here to talk about Elixir, so let's do that. Before we dive in, let's talk about terminology I'm using uh, in my slides, so you, you could catch up. Um, when I say finger or finger event, uh, I'm, I'm talking about finger number, which got sent from Arduino. When I say key, this is the key which a uh, user has pressed, so it's uh, the, the letter, I don't know, H, if we type in hello. Um, a letter is the current letter in the text which a user, or whoever is learning to type, are supposed to press. Now let's talk about how we get those finger events from Arduino to our Elixir. So we have the value coming from Arduino, which is just a finger number. Then I'm going to introduce the serial umbrella application, which I mentioned, which is going to add to um, that data an ID event. So we could then map it with the key event. Um, so we're adding the ID events, and then we pass it to the core application. From there, we pass it to event handler, and then event handler do the, doing the job of matching it all. Okay, let's talk about the serial application. Um, serial application here is to uh, just get in all of the events from finger and pass it to the core. This is its own responsibility. Possibly do some formatting if needed, but uh, its own responsibility to just take the event, pass it through. So we generate the, another umbrella application. This is the last one we need. Uh, we add a dependency, a serial, which allows us to com a communication to uh, words. Uh, we add our core application as a dependency, so we could talk to it. And in our init callback, uh, we need to say this, the serial port, which we are going to use for communication. Um, here, you need to be careful to make sure that the port you're specifying here is actually the one which is enabled because I've stumbled across that and it was a long time trying to understand why I don't get the events, but it, it all was that uh, the port wasn't the correct one. And then we set in the speed, connecting, and that's done. And the next important part is to actually listen to those events. So what we get here is data. Data is our data which come in from Arduino. So in my case, I'm just passing the finger event, a uh, finger number. So here I'm pass, um, a pattern matching on finger number and then I'm passing it through to the core uh, application with the correct finger number and the uh, finger ID event. And with this in place, we have only one last piece left to implement and this is our uh, logic part. It's going to have a lot of elixir. <laughs> um, so, to recap, we get events from a serial to the core, from the core to event handler, and we get events from the channel uh, to the core and to the event handler. So, we get all of the events get to the event handler. So event handler is the one who knows all about events. Uh, to help us decide um, on events matching, um, I come up with the idea to uh, introduce an event struct, which is going to contain a key events and a finger events. 
Um, so whenever we get a, a, an event from finger, it's going to look if the uh, associated with this event ID uh, key exists. If it doesn't, it just stores it in the map and waits. Um, and then on the later stage, if we get the key e event coming in, it's going to check if the uh, associated to this finger event exists. If it finds the, the same ID, then it's going to do the processing. If it doesn't, it just stores it in the map and waits for the associative event. I'm sorry the image is not big enough, but I'll, I'll talk through it. Uh, so once we get two events together, um, we are going to, um, to decide whether our finger with which we press the key match the letter we're supposed to be pressing. Uh, if uh, yes, then we are going to continue doing the match and we asking if the uh, key uh, is the one we're supposed to be pressing with for this letter we see on the screen. Um, and the same we do, so we do set of matches. And the result of this could be that the key is correct and the finger is correct, so this is all match, then nothing match, and there are two other options when um, someone presses with the right finger but wrong key or wrong uh, finger but right key. And after that, we need to clear that event struct so it doesn't get uh, extended and then it will be harder to uh, extract the values from the struct or map. Uh, so we clear the processed event to recap those uh, match results. So let's see how this works. So we got uh, to our core application the, the key event. We pass it to our event handler. Um, we do the same with the finger. And then event handler uh, has a struct events, which has a key events and the finger events. To start with is just uh, empty maps. Um, we initial, initialize uh, the event handler with empty, empty struct. And the next part is interesting. So when we get key event, um, then we are going to see if we have associative finger event. So we try to fetch the event from the map. Uh, if we, there, there are two possibilities. We either have it in the map or not. Uh, if we don't have it, it's going to be nil. If we do have it, it's going to be an event. Then we pass it to our process key function. So if you look at this, we either pass in nil or we pass in the event. If we pass in nil, um, then that means that this is the first event which comes through. Uh, so we just store it in, in the struct and uh, we continue. So we add it to our keys event struct and wait for the finger event to come in. If it does exist, then we need to, to take it out and do off the matching logic. So we take it out and then we call our uh, match a match. This is the module which is doing all of the matching logic. Um, we pass in the key, the finger and the current letter. Uh, we don't know here anything about text or current letter, so we go to the core which knows about it and, and, and get it. And it just returns us uh, uh, the first letter in the text. And then we call the function, and it goes to our match module. In our match module, we're going to have a few steps. First, we need to match on the key. So we have a current letter and we have a key and we need to compare them. This method is very easy. We just say it's true or false. Okay, the next step is to see if the finger is correct for this current letter. So we have another function which is going to return true or false. But to be able to say with which finger, which finger should be for which key, we need to have some kind of knowledge about it. Um, so there is a finger number, which is just a, a constant, and uh, then there is a map, 
uh, this is for QWERTY, but uh, it's uh, arguably the best way out for programmers, having a lot of load on our pinky fingers, but uh, this is for QWERTY. So then we do the match, and we get true or false for uh, correctness of the finger or key, and we pass it to the total match function, which is going to um, return us one of the results, which is all much, nothing much, or some of them much. Uh, then the next step would be to notify the UI. So I'll, for now, just uh, print it to the console, and uh, I'll come back to notifying the UI on the later stage. But what's uh, important after that is to clear the, the struct from the, the events which we have processed already. Um, to do that, we're just uh, taking it out by the ID we know, by the key we know. And don't forget to send a no reply for the handle cast. The same happens for finger event. The logic is just the same, so I wouldn't talk through all of this again, but the logic is the same. We get the finger event, then we see if we have corresponding key event. If we do, then we do the processing. If we, do, if we don't, we store it in the map, and we wait for the corresponding event to come through. Let's talk about notifying the UI of the match result. So once we have the result, which comes in, well, for, for this, in this case, uh, I do that uh, it has the result, which is the atom of all much, not, not much, or something much, and the uh, event ID, pass it through to the core, pass it through to Phoenix channel, goes to phase and phase it and renders the result in the browser. So we call even handler result with the result and ID, and handle cast for this function looks like that. So if we get all match, um, then we should clear the current letter. So that means that the person who has been typing the, the, the text, he got it right, so we need to take it out from the whole text, um, which is just getting the, the first letter and taking out from the text. If he hasn't got it right, then we don't take it out, we leave it there for him to try again. Um, and we uh, send the result uh, to the channel, Phoenix channel. Phoenix channel is listening for those messages, then he broadcast it, push it to the socket, and then it renders uh, to, to the browser. Okay, and I did record a little demo. I'm not daring to do any live demos. I'm, I'm not that brave. <laughs> so that's me trying it out. There is a text to type in, and then I was, the green is uh, the, the keys I get right, and then I get some of them wrong. No much. That's it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> to summarize all of this talk, um, first uh, I want to to say that when uh, people talking about Elixir, when they describe an Elixir, they usually use adjectives like um, fault and concurrent, distributed. But I think there is one adjective which is missing. It's inspiring. Uh, Elixir has inspired me to do um, some of the interesting projects I've been doing recently. Um, so I think inspiring is missing there. Uh, getting uh, hardware involved in, in your project is fun. 
Um, it's not that scary. I thought it, <laughs> I thought it was. It, it looks quite a little bit scary, but when you actually start trying, and when you get your first LED flashing, it's really rewarding, and then you get more senses and and um, you find out about about all of the uh, chips and boards, and uh, it's really fun. Um, I've been to. Uh, Nerves uh, workshop yesterday, and uh, that was really good. And we built this amazing badge. Uh, so I think uh, if you if you want to uh, feel rewarded, like being a software developer and what you're doing, it's worth going and getting some senses and and plugging them together and and feeling feeling good about it. Um, Another point to take is whenever you think about uh, your Elixir application, it helps uh, to think in the way you may structure them into umbrella applications. Um, so you then start to think which, which pieces of your application are isolated from each other, and then you try to identify your dependencies, uh, which helps on the later stage to test and, and to see what, what's happening. And uh, data flow diagrams were very, very helpful. On the early stage, when, like after hacking event, when it was all working, and it was like, great, okay, it's working. But then when I had to uh, put it nice and structure it into umbrella applications, defining the responsibility of each application and defining those APIs was a little bit hard. And when I start to draw those uh, data flow diagrams, then it helped me to, to see w w what should be where and how it's going to all work together. Um, thank you for coming and listening. Uh, this project is on GitHub if you want to check it out. Um, I'm on Twitter if you want to pin me in, give me a feedback, I'm quite happy to, to hear. Um, thank you. Um, I think I have a little bit of time left, uh, so if you have any questions.